So uh, as far as timing goes, this is probably the worst timing to get sick. Uh, we are on the final installment. This is the last message on the, the mini series that we started on the topic of salvation. So, uh, or the topic of uh, the foundations for Christianity. So uh, if you miss any of those messages, just uh, please, I encourage you to go watch them on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you can still remember, we began this series uh, as a response uh, to the gathering or the convocation of God's people and God commanded for his people in the a Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right, The first and the last days of the feast, they are to uh, gather. So this formal gathering, these convocations, I said that um, these are a pointer to the Sabbath, and these are a pointer to uh, our worship services that we do, the formal gathering of believers at church, uh, the worship services that we do here uh, at GBC every every Sunday. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, you know throughout uh, the evangelical circles that uh, the worship of God has become uh watered down uh it's become more of a rock concert it's uh become more catering to people's uh, entertainment needs uh, instead of the original purpose for it which is to uh, just drop everything and just enjoy the salvation that god has given to us that's the purpose of the feast of unleavened bread to begin with right so um that led us to the study of the basic or the foundations of christianity well you know, because we 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 somehow we've lost that the joy of our salvation that we 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 come to church for the wrong reasons, and I don't want uh, not any of us to to be doing that, uh, and that's why we uh, we went on and uh, you know for the past few weeks uh, been talking about the salvation that God uh, brought to the Israelites back in uh, the Book of Exodus and uh, the salvation that He brings. To us believers nowadays uh, through faith in the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. So um, I also said uh, that this uh, the theme of salvation is really uh, the main theme of the Bible. Uh, I said that, uh, that that the theme of salvation is uh, or can be found uh, from the beginning, uh, which is in Genesis three fifteen, where God promised that the seed, or not promised, but prophesied that the seed of the woman will. You know, one day defeat the enemy, uh, which is the seed of the serpent, uh, and the serpent itself, I would say. Uh, so it started there and all the way to the book of Revelation. Uh, the, the, this theme of salvation uh, is just uh, prevalent and continuous throughout the whole uh, of the Bible. And I said that the, the goal, uh, God's goal when it comes to salvation, uh, is to restore his relationship with mankind uh to restore uh because because that's what pretty much that's that's the main thing that broke and when that relationship broke between man and god everything else in all salvation uh or sorry in all creation uh broke uh because of that so god's main goal in in saving is to restore that uh to restore that relationship with man so uh, having said that uh we've answered three questions about this theme or of salvation uh first question we answered was why does god need to save uh, and i said that the reason why god needed to save is because we our our ancestors adam and eve ate of that fruit of knowledge of good and evil and then once they did that uh, they began to think they were convinced that they are their own gods uh, and then from there it branches out to other different uh forms of that sin but the original sin that sin that adam and eve committed was that uh, it's not just disobedience but it's that um, gaining knowledge that they're not supposed to gain uh, only god should have that kind of knowledge and power uh, they took it for themselves uh, because of the tempting of the enemy uh, and that's why god needed to save step in and save us the other question that we took up was uh, what does god save us from but for a lot of people uh, this would be sin which is it's not uh, but really what god saves us from is the wrath to come for sinners who are against god he's saving us from that so we can say we are saved from the consequence of sin which is not just death as far as physical death is concerned 
because if you really think about it, physical death is really a blessing in disguise for believers. So uh, that's a different sermon. But anyway, uh, what does God save us from? He saves us from that judgment day. Uh, that day will come when God will restore everything back to how he designed it to be. And uh, he wants to save, salvage his people uh, from that judgment. Uh, then we took up or answered the question, how does God save? And uh, this was, I think, last week's sermon. How does God save? God saves by allowing the transfer of sin between sinner, the human sinner, and the sacrifice. Uh, back in the Old Testament, that's how it was. Back in Leviticus, that's where it started. Uh, to, to transfer the sin from human to sacrifice. Because again, God wanted to dwell with his people. He wanted to fellowship with his people. And the only way he could do that was to cleanse them of sin. But if there's no sacrifice, which sacrifice is needed to satisfy the justice of God. If there's no sacrifice for sin, there's no bloodshed, uh, there's no forgiveness, and there's no atonement. So uh, because of God's grace, his mercy towards human beings, he allowed that transfer to happen. So that uh, as you transfer your sin towards the, the host, the sacrificial host, once you lay your hand on that host, the sin is transferred, uh, and therefore that host has to be destroyed. So instead of you, it's the host that's destroyed. So I said that it's, that's a pointer to Christ as well. So instead of us taking on the penalty, Christ became our penal uh, substitute. So now this morning, we're going to put all these answers together. Uh, and we're going to answer our final question, which I kind of ended with last week. <clears throat> final question we need to answer is, uh, what did God save us for? What did God save us for? Why is God saving a people to himself, for himself? Because that's what God's doing. Uh, beginning with uh, Adam and Eve, he didn't, he didn't curse them. Instead, he let them live. He kicked them out of the garden because he, his presence can pretty much destroy them because of their sin. He kicked them out of the garden, but it was through them, through the genealogies afterwards, through the generations afterwards, that God uh, brought a people to himself, uh, which that's how we, we got to Exodus, right? So from all the people from Adam and Eve, uh, God chose Moses, or sorry, God chose Noah, and then God chose Abraham and Moses, and, or, and then Jacob and Isaac and, Mo, and Moses, uh, and then from there, David. Um, so um, why is he doing that? Why is God saving a people for himself? Uh, I believe that our answer to that question lies in our understanding of God's kingdom. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, we could define God's kingdom as you know, the whole universe, because he pretty much created everything. That's his kingdom. But how do you actually define God's kingdom? Are we, right now, are we in God's kingdom? In a sense, yes, because he owns everything. In a sense, no, because he's not the ruler of this world right now. So not yet. Uh, so how would we define God's kingdom? I'm going to quote a couple of uh, definitions, and then we'll use that to jump off uh, in our study of this uh, last question. So, um, what is the kingdom of God, or God's kingdom? What is it? Uh, Graham Goldsworthy's definition of the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. God's people in God's place under God's rule. Uh, Vaughn Roberts took that definition and added one more thing. Uh, so Vaughn Roberts' definition of God's kingdom or the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Okay, so God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. So for uh, a place to be considered kingdom of God, people in it has to be God's people. Those people have to be submitted to God's rule, uh, and those people are under uh, God's blessing as well. So when you look at Adam and Eve before the fall, they were God's people. Where were they? In God's place, in Eden, where God is. Uh, and were they submitted to the rule of God? Yes, before the fall, they were uh, 
submitted to God's rule. God was ruling over them, and then they they ruled over the whole creation. So uh, when you look at that, um, that was God's kingdom, right? You can define that as God's kingdom. Uh, but when sin came along, Adam and Eve were no longer God's people because they were sinners. Uh, they were not under his rule anymore. Uh, they were banished from his place. Uh, but the blessing was still there, right? God dressed them up. God, uh, you know, gave them all the necessities that they needed in order to survive outside the kingdom for the purpose of using the woman's seed in order to save humanity. So now, when you look at it that way, God's purpose, again, for salvation, God's salvation plan, is to put everything back in order to how it was before Adam and Eve fell into sin. And I said this last week, instead of starting over, God chose to save Adam and Eve, use the seed of the woman as a promised hope uh, of a Messiah, and in order to begin kingdom uh, restoration. Uh, so uh, when Jesus came, uh, what happened was God's kingdom came to earth. Well, why do I say that? Because Jesus is not, not only God's people, he's God's person, he's God. He's God become flesh. God become human, so he's God's person. He is uh, the perfect example of living under God's rule. He was submitted fully to God, even until uh, death. Uh, and he never committed any sin. Uh, and Jesus is also where God dwells. Remember what Jesus said? Uh, he, he said, I, I'm able to destroy this temple, uh, bring it back in three, in three, in three days. Uh, that's him talking about uh, what's going to happen to him. Uh, and he's referring to himself as a temple. And the temple is where the Israelites come to worship God. That's God's place. So in a sense, Jesus represents God's kingdom. That's why when Jesus first uh, um, started his ministry, uh, John the Baptist introduced him uh, uh, as that, right? A kingdom of God is at hand. It is here. It's near. Repent and be baptized, each and every one of you. Um, because God's kingdom is coming to earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means that God's restoration project, as far as uh, his salvation plan is concerned, is going to happen through Christ, the kingdom of God coming in through the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, how does God accomplish the kingdom restoration in Christ? The uh, parables in Matthew 13 will help us answer those questions or will give us some answers to that question. Let's read uh, Matthew 13, 31 to 33. Matthew 13, 31 to 33. 13, 31. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants, and it, become, and it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in his branches. He told another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. So the, the, if you read the parables uh, in, in chapter 13 of uh, Matthew, what, it, what it's doing, what Jesus is doing is he's painting for us a picture of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and this was during the time of the, uh, the disciples, right? So what's what's happening is that these descriptions that we're going to see about what the kingdom of heaven is is still accurate today, and that's because that kingdom restoration project is ongoing. It's still happening uh, even as we speak, and we're all part of it. Uh, so uh, you look at the first two parables uh, in in Matthew thirteen, parable of the sower and the parable of the weeds. It talks about the nature of the kingdom. What does what does the kingdom look like, or what is it going to look like as far as the disciples are concerned back in those days? So Jesus describes for them, uh, to the disciples, what the kingdom of heaven will look like on earth during the restoration project. 
Okay. Now, if you know these parables, it talks about how the kingdom of heaven will have a mixture of people, right? Some with good soil in their hearts, some with thorny soil, some with rocky. Okay. Uh, some of the people of the kingdom will be wheat. Some will be wheat. So if you if you think about that, isn't that what the church looks like now? So from the outset, Jesus is already saying the kingdom of heaven at, at its you know at the middle of the restoration, the middle of the restoration project, the kingdom of heaven will not be perfect. Uh, it's going to come to perfection in Christ, and He's standing there as a uh, testament to that. That it's going to get there, but right now it's not there yet. Uh, so from the outset, the kingdom of heaven is not perfect, and we see that in the church today. Uh, you know what they say about the church, right? Uh, it's like a garage. Not not everything that goes into the church is a car. Not, not everybody that goes to church. No, sorry, not everything that goes into the garage is a car. Uh, and not every person who attends church is a Christian. So uh, we see that in the church today. Uh, we see weeds in the church, and there's some wheat in the church. Uh, there's some people with rocky soil in their hearts that these messages, they keep coming to church, but none of these things are affecting them. Uh, some of them, they just don't want to come to church at all. Uh, so you see that picture in the church today. You see it uh, in the world outside. Uh, if we're going to consider God's kingdom as the whole universe, and Earth as his main kind of focal point, Earth as his Eden, so to speak. Um, yeah, there's a lot of unbelievers out there that hate God. There's a lot of unbelievers out there. And then there's believers that proclaim that they are believing, that they believe in God, yet live lives that are uh, the opposite. So, uh, so again, the point of, that Jesus is trying to make is that kingdom of heaven is not perfect. Uh, one of the reasons we're taking this theme up of uh, salvation is because a lot of evangelical churches have started preaching about a different gospel or are, are preaching a different gospel, uh, which in turn has uh, resulted in wrong worship of God. This is not what God called us to do as far as these complications that we're supposed to have is concerned. So um, so if you're a disciple, just imagine, like, okay, Jesus is calling you 12. Okay, we're going to start this movement. And this movement, it's, you know, we're going to, you know, share this good news. It's about the Son of God coming to earth. And we're going to start this movement. And, you know, you know what happened afterwards, right? Their teacher in this parable is telling them, well, you know what? Once we do start this movement, it's not going to be perfect right away. Uh, in fact, it's going to be a mix. Like, people will you know be wheat and wheat growing together uh it's not gonna be uh like a perfect kingdom right away it's not uh so if you're a disciple i would that would be discouraging <laughs> yeah it would if somebody told me if if i was jeremiah you know the story of jeremiah uh god called him to speak to the to the to the people of israel uh but he told him no worry, no, no matter how much you talk, no matter how much you preach, nobody's going to listen to you. If God told me that, I'd be like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. But um, praise God, okay? Jesus didn't stop there with those two parables. Because even though those parables, talking about the kingdom of heaven, uh, even though it seems like this kingdom is on rocky ground, uh, because of the internal influences that are corrupting it from the inside, Jesus gives him another two parables that follow the first two, uh, which is the uh, sower and the parable of the weeds. Uh, and these next two parables talk about the power and the influence of the kingdom of heaven. So it is a an encouragement to the disciples who just heard the first two parables. So the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven is talking about the power and influence of the kingdom of heaven. So uh, these parables, the main focus of these parables show that the kingdom of heaven, even though it starts off really small, right, it will ultimately grow into the most powerful kingdom the world has ever known. Okay, Throughout the history of humanity, there has been kingdoms that you know, startup uh, empires that are built up and they go down. 
empires built up go down not this one this one that jesus is saying is so powerful um, it's going to pretty much take over the world right it's going to be the most powerful kingdom the world has ever known and the parable of the mustard seed talks about that it talks about how small seeds will grow unproportionately big and larger than its humble beginnings so big that this seed will grow <laughs> and birds will be able to nest in its branches Can you imagine that birds will be able to nest in its branches if you know the mustard seed uh mustard plant it doesn't grow into a tree it's like a big bush uh, so how is a bush going to support birds and birds nests uh, for that matter um this mustard seed that jesus is talking about is going to grow that big it's unproportionate to its size so it's going to grow so big that it's able to support birds nests in its branches um and what's what what is jesus trying to teach the disciple here the disciples here again jesus is encouraging his disciples by saying that even though the kingdom of heaven will have a mixture of weeds and wheat and not all who are in the kingdom are citizens they will still reap the benefits of the kingdom that's what jesus is teaching uh, the birds represent outside influences the uh, people who are not kingdom citizens will still benefit from the kingdom that's how great the kingdom is going to be and it's happening right now you see it right now the influence of the gospel in outreach efforts around the world is uh is helping those who are in need right now the help that we provide we don't ask are you christian okay i'll help you if you're a christian or i'll help you if you become a christian no we just help we don't ask if they're christian or not right so um what how, how does that work because the true citizens of the kingdom that's their nature their nature is to be like god right so they're, they're growing into that uh god's nature is that that even though adam and seed, uh, eve sinned uh, god didn't go away that's it You're, you guys are done i'm gonna destroy you now i'm just gonna start over he didn't do that he showed mercy. He showed grace uh, to these people and even helped them out. Uh, helped them out physically, fighting for them food and water and drink. Uh, or you can call it uh, common grace. You gotta remember that term, common grace. It is God's grace for the whole world. We're, we're blessed that we haven't been destroyed yet because of all the things that are going on in our society. Uh, we're blessed that God hasn't destroyed us yet. That his promise on the rainbow to Noah, that he will never do that again by water. He hasn't done yet. Uh, meanwhile, what we're doing is we're mocking him. Right? Think about it. Um, the colors of the rainbow. Which flag uses that? the pride flag it's the lgbtq sign so instead of it being a sign that god's uh, mercy and grace for mankind is is available because he hung up his bow on the cloud he said to to noah if i said moses earlier forgive me but it was it's noah right he he, he, he hung up his bow what does that mean a bow is a weapon of war right so god saying no more i'm not gonna have war with humans anymore i hung up my bow that bow is now being used as a mockery of god's mercy and grace because of the lifestyle that it represents uh, but if you think about it are the is that movement being destroyed no in fact it's more and more people are joining it even christians uh but but that's that, that's what I'm saying. The, the kingdom of heaven uh, right now is not at its perfect state. Um, um, but those who are true citizens of the kingdom, they will do kingdom work in that they will still help and they will still show the love of God uh, through how they help and how they live. Uh, and this will happen until the restoration project is 
finished. Uh, now, one, when it comes to this kingdom gaining size, if you look at the stats for the largest religious groups, uh, professing Christians make up the largest chunk. Uh, according to PewSearch.org, I don't know if they're able to show this graphic, in 2015, uh, professing Christians reached 2.3 million, uh, billion. Uh, the next religious group uh, are the Muslims, which comprise of 1.8 billion. As far as uh, those who claim to be Muslims are, are concerned. So, and if you look at the graph as well, the graph says that the Jews are the, the least, the smallest, right? But their influence in Christianity made us the biggest. So, you know, this, 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 this parable of the mustard seed has multiple <laughs> applications for it, multiple truths to it that you can see uh, i don't want to say multiple truths just just one truth to it but multiple examples of that truth that we can see in our word in our world today the jews is the smallest but the christians which arguably came from the jews is the largest small to large uh, just something to think about uh, so in the parable of the mustard seed, that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is encouraging his disciples, telling them that the kingdom of heaven is like that. It's like a mustard seed coming from small humble beginnings to ultimately becoming the most powerful kingdom on earth. Uh, but until then, not only um, will other nations and other countries benefit from the kingdom of heaven or from, Christian, uh, from Christians themselves, if you look at it as well, Christians are also the most persecuted religion in history. Cato.org says this, and I quote, The group Open Doors USA figures that 360 million Christians last year lived in countries where persecution was significant. <clears throat> Roughly 5,600 Christians were murdered. More than 6,000 were detained and imprisoned, and another 4,000 were kidnapped. In addition, more than 5,000 churches and other religious facilities were destroyed. Ah, so we are the largest, but we're also the most persecuted. I was listening to my son's uh, physics class uh, this week, uh, and a representative from the Muslim faith uh, came in to do a presentation on Muslim Heritage Day, I think. That's what they call it. Uh, so it's basically just telling the students about the Muslim religion uh, and encouraging kids to, who are Muslim to be proud of their heritage as Muslims. So I asked Caleb, uh, so when is Christian Heritage Week? He checked his calendar. There's no Christian Heritage Week. There's Jewish, there's Hindu, there's all the other ones. No Christian, no Christian Heritage Week. So <laughs> sometimes, you know, you can look at the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, and if you read it the way I explained it, that these birds are, they're not really part of the kingdom, but they just benefit from it. Sometimes you read that parable like that and you can, you can be angry at how Christianity is being treated today. We're the ones who are there first when the war happened in um, Europe. Uh, whenever there's a storm, it's always the Christians that come in and provide aid. But the way we're being treated uh, is just, right, uh, unthinkable. Uh, and it's hard to look at that and not get angry. But uh, if we're going to look at what God said uh, or what Jesus said in the parable of the weeds, he tells us, don't pull out the weeds, you know, there will come a time in the harvest season when his workers will do that, that the weeds will be separated from the wheat. In the meantime, and I share this with the workers at GBC, doesn't matter if there are weeds in our church, keep working the soil. It's not our job to judge the weeds at church. There's a lot. Keep working the soil. Keep working the field. Yes, it's going to get hard because some of these weeds, they... They, you know, they, they make you allergic, they make you sneeze, they make you sick. Uh, but the, the owner of the land said, don't pull them out. Just keep working the soil. Uh, and so I think when you uh, look at that in the context of Matthew 13, it's, a, it's an encouragement 
for the disciples who will be starting this. They're the ones who starts off this project. Yes, Jesus ultimately is the, he's the cornerstone, right? And then all other stones are built around that. But it's the apostles who, after Jesus went up to heaven, they're the ones who started the church, uh, which is still going strong today. So it's an encouragement for them. That even though kingdom of heaven is going to be a mixed bag of people, ultimately it's going to grow. And it's going to grow huge, so huge, that uh, it'll even support uh, and help out those who are not citizens. So yeah, uh, what about the leaven? Uh, <laughs> I kind of discussed this already during our uh, the sermon on the Feast of Unleavened Bread when we took up the importance of the leaven, but we're going to take a deeper look into this parable this morning. So uh, the purpose of this parable is to show the disciples that the kingdom of heaven has powerful external influences, which is shown in the parable of the mustard seed, and it also has a powerful internal influence. Uh, all right. So in the in the parable of the mustard seed, it, it shows that the, the influence that Christianity has externally will even benefit the birds. It will even benefit those who are not part of the kingdom. Now this parable of leaven talks about same thing it talks about influence but this time it's an internal influence and the main point of this parable again is that the leaven is like the kingdom of, of heaven that no matter how small it is compared to the the dough that is being put into it will still permeate and influence until ultimately the whole dough is leavened and you notice no matter how small leaven is, you stick it into the dough, the dough doesn't change it. The dough doesn't make it unleavened. Leaven, no matter how small it is, changes the dough. The, it makes the dough leavened. There is no stopping this leaven from permeating and influencing the dough, right? So now, that's the main point that Jesus is trying to convey to his disciples in this parable right now i was made aware the first time i discussed this uh in a sermon that this parable uh has different interpretations uh so when you hear something like that don't take it as a shot to yourself but actually study it uh, study the other interpretation and see which one is which because i could have i could have been wrong uh so i looked it up some of the other interpretations is the parable of this parable. Uh, and I keep going back to this one. <laughs> that the leaven uh, is pretty much being referred to by Jesus here in a good sense. So um, the reason why the other interpretations exist is because uh, people uh, look at leaven uh, all throughout the Bible. Leaven is pretty much uh, refer or used to refer to uh, sin or hypocrisy or uh, right uh, so or evil uh, so but if you read this parable it doesn't make sense for leaven to be that uh, because it's being used by christ to refer to the kingdom right so we cannot and i said this before you cannot look at a word in the bible and interpret it the same way and not look at the context the context is what determines the meaning of that word. So um, when you look at leaven, yes, it is used, and I said this before, to associate with sin and corruption. But in the context of the word, the way Jesus is using it, it doesn't make sense, right? Just read, just read the verse for yourself. The kingdom of leaven, or sorry, the kingdom of heaven, sorry, it's late. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. So if I were to ask you the question, what is leaven likened to in this parable? Your answer should be the kingdom of heaven, right? Simple. Now replace leaven with sin and corruption or evil. The sentence would say that the kingdom of leaven is like sin or the kingdom of heaven is corrupt. Does that make sense? Given the fact that Jesus already mentioned that during the first two, two parables uh, and are giving the disciples some hope with these two parables, ultimately, and what these two parables are saying 
is an encouragement because of the first two parables, because of the parable of the sower and the weeds. Right? Jesus is trying to encourage. So why would he say that the kingdom of heaven is like corrupt? He wouldn't say that. Um, like one example, uh, when you look at the word lion, lion or beast, usually it's lion, uh, the actual word lion. If you look at lion, Peter used to describe lion as the devil, right? In First Peter 5.8, you know, sin is like a approaching lion, always ready to attack. But Jesus is also described as a lion, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Does that mean Jesus is evil? No. Uh, so you have to look at it uh, as far as context goes. So the kingdom of heaven is likened to heaven because Jesus is trying to show his disciples the power of the kingdom that even though it is put into this big batch of dough and it was a big batch of dough this little leaven is not going to get corrupted it is not going to turn into dough it is going to make the dough leaven is the one who's going to influence the dough uh, and you see that in the ministry of jesus right in the ministry of jesus he touched he would touch uh people with uh like communicable diseases like uh like um those who are who have leprosy excuse me everybody else runs away from leprosy because when they touch a leper they get the leprosy like since covid i touch somebody with covid i get covid jesus is different jesus will touch somebody and they would become healed like how he is instead of him becoming like them that's the that's the picture that jesus is pointing to in this parable that the kingdom of heaven is that powerful it, it doesn't matter how small it is it doesn't get corrupted it's not the one that's going to get corrupted it's going to influence anything that it touches so that the power of the kingdom of heaven is not in its armies or weapons or great walls that's not how the kingdom of heaven is powerful the power of the kingdom is that it will work from the inside out it will work from the inside out. If you notice, in the kingdom, uh, the in the parable of the leaven, leaven is like into the kingdom which the woman hid, put in, and hid it in the dough. Right, three measures of flour, big batch of dough, with little leaven. So what do we see there? When Jesus was first brought in to this world let's say again this world is um, god's kingdom although he's not ruling in it right now he will one day and to start off the restoration project he inserted jesus into the world and when i say inserted jesus wasn't born like anybody like any other human being he was born through a virgin right he was something else he was special in that sense what god is trying to do is he's inserting this new species of humans new species of people on earth and what that species is going to do is it's going to multiply and multiply and multiply it's going to start this restoration process this leavening process until the whole world is going to be like that one human but it started off with one jesus so god in his restoration project inserted god's person in Jesus, God's rule in Jesus, and God's place in Jesus. And what Jesus did was he inserted that through disciples, through his disciples that followed him, and the disciples that followed him passed that on, their disciples, and it kept going and going and going until it came to us. That's how Christians, professing Christians right now, are numbered at two point whatever billion people. So the other thing to notice is because of this, the woman hid, okay, the woman hid the leaven in this big dough of in this big batch of dough. That means that even though we don't see leaven, because it's so small, it's just hidden in the big batch. All you see is dough. Even though you don't see it, there's God's people in there, God's rule is in there, God's place is in there, and it's expanding, it's doing its work. How do you see that nowadays? Nowadays, there's a lot of underground churches. Right? Underground churches in North Korea, underground churches in China. These places uh, are prime examples of that. 
being hated. Even Jesus was hated, right? Because Herod was trying to kill all the baby boys back then. When he was born, born that's why he was brought to Egypt first and came back, right? If you know the story of Jesus, you read the Gospels, you know the story, that's what happened. He was hidden. And the, the, the leaven in this sense is also hidden. But it's still working, even though you don't see it. It's still working. North Korea, China, underground churches, that's what they're doing. We don't see it. We hear about a lot of um, persecution that's happening in those areas for Christians. But sooner or later, God will save those who are His in North Korea. God will save those who are His in China, even though these people are outnumbered. Outnumbered, outgunned, out everything. They will still accomplish the work. They're going to get the job done. Uh, more and more people uh, have come to the knowledge of the gospel because of these unnamed heroes of faith, these missionaries that are working, that are unknown, hidden. Uh, and not just them. There are some people here who are working that uh, are hidden. Uh, I'm not talking about hidden as in you're trying to hide your Christianity. I'm talking about, I don't know what work you do. Uh, I don't know what kingdom work you're doing or what God has called you to do. But I'm saying that God has injected us, placed us in this society to do that kind of work. Uh, and we should do it. And we should do it uh, with faith, trusting that God will accomplish the work that he has uh, began uh, with Christ and with the disciples and then passed on to us. Uh, uh, at the same time, um, you know, it's difficult for me to look at the state of the church today uh, because uh, instead of us being the influencers, and I said this earlier during, the, during what I said earlier, instead of us being the influencers, we're the ones being influenced. Uh, instead of treating the root issue of, you know, social injustices or racism and same-sex marriage, instead of treating the root issue of those social issue problems or abortion, uh, the root issue of that is sin. Instead of treating that, uh, a lot of Christians have lined up to become activists. Sometimes they even become activists for these movements, instead of against these movements. Uh, but sad in that sense. Uh, that's why Jesus also gave us those two parables at the beginning of Matthew 13, that there will be some weak. Uh, uh, but the one thing that we can count on is that Jesus' rule, Jesus' word will be true. It will always be true, no matter what. Those of us who are truly leavened will influence the kingdom, and nothing will be able to stop that. Uh, so now, uh, what? how do we answer our question? What are we saved for based on those two parables? Uh, I would say that the answer to our question, what are we saved for based on those two par parables? I would say this. We are saved to continue the kingdom work that Jesus started from the time he was born to the time he worked in ministry to the time he died and was resurrected. We were to continue that. What did he do? Passed on his teaching to his disciples. And that's what it says in the Great Commission, right? Um, what, what does it say in the Great Commission uh, in Matthew? <laughs> Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I taught you. Uh, though I will be with you always. Uh, so uh, that's what we're saved for. Now, do that. Uh, God, in his grace, injected, put in, hid the leaven of Christ in all of those who are going to be saved. Excuse me. That faith in the gospel is the leaven that I said a few weeks back. And that leaven will grow. There's no stopping it. That's its nature to grow. And our whole beings will be leavened. Uh, and once that happens, we are able to be used by God in whatever kingdom work he calls us to. Uh, that is how God created a people or is creating a people to himself. It's this new species of human beings coming from Christ. Species that are in God's is that are God's people under God's rule, submitted to God, and with God residing in them, they're God's place, residing them through the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
there are God's place. That's how um, God is weeding out, so to speak, the leaven of Adam that is in all of us. He's inserting this new leaven in us, uh, which is the faith in the gospel. Uh, that's how God will take out the old leaven of Adam and replace it with the new leaven of Christ. That's why it's also said in the, in the scriptures that those who are in Christ, they are new creatures or there's a new creation. Uh, this new set of human beings are fearless in the work of the kingdom because even death has been defeated for them. We have no fear of saying, proclaiming uh, what our faith is. Whenever the opportunity comes, you say it. Because the worst thing they can do to you is kill you. And if they kill you, they're doing you a favor. <laughs> Pretty much what that is. These are the true worshipers in spirit because they know the value of their salvation. My question is, which one are you? Obviously, we're all growing. We're all at different stages of growth. The leavening power of the faith is, uh, you know, takes time. Remember I said this before? But uh, as long as you're growing in faith, I think you will one day get to where God wants you to be and he'll use you mightily, no matter what that is. Uh, and it's going to be all for kingdom restoration work. Uh, so I hope that's a blessing to all of you. Uh, next week, we're going to go back to our Exodus story. And I hope to be there in person next week. Uh, so please pray for me. and pray for my family that they don't get what I have. Uh, and uh, pray that you, uh, the Holy Spirit will continue to minister to you guys. Uh, that this sermon uh, was preached. Makes sense. Uh, and not just makes sense, but be applicable uh, to our lives today. All right, let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be great. And be gracious unto you. And be gracious. Gracious, gracious. Ah.